Mac Voices listeners and viewers. Our friends at Squarespace have a great do-it-yourself website builder that allows you to make a website or blog in just a few minutes. Squarespace gives you a free domain name, handles all the hosting, and has 24-hour customer support. Everything on the platform is drag and drop, so it's incredibly easy to use. The templates are customizable to your own look and feel and let your content do all the talking. Additionally, you can switch to a different template at any time. Go to squarespace.com slash macvoices to start a free trial. Use the offer code macvoices2, that's macvoices and the number 2, when you decide to purchase and you'll receive a 10% discount. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. Mac Voices is at Macworld iWorld 2013 in San Francisco. I'm Chuck Joyner. We're in the Mac Practice booth talking to Mark Hollis about Mac Practice. Mark, it's good to see you. Hey, nice to see you, Chuck. We missed each other last year, so we've got a lot of catch-up to do on Mac Practice. And, of course, a few things have changed in healthcare since we last saw each other. How about if I just skip to just this year? Because so many things have changed, I don't think I can catch up on last year as well. Is that That, right? that sounds fair. What's, Mac Practice is, of course, for physicians. And it's, it's, it's an interesting product to me because this is a place where we desperately need help in record keeping and standardization. Yeah. Well, actually, Mac Practice has the leading applications for uh, physicians, dentists, chiropractors, and our care professionals. And we have about uh, 4,500 installations across the United States and in 35 countries, 30,000 users in total and about 15,000 providers. But we, our primary, the, lar- the largest number of clients that we have are physicians, and they do need the most help. <laughs> so, And the government's giving them a lot of help, so you want to hear about that? <laughs> As it relates to Mac practice, perhaps otherwise we may degenerate into a political discussion and we'll be here all day. Okay, well, uh, as far as I know, we don't have any control over them giving them help, but they are giving them about $19 billion. And when we spoke two years ago, that was what was new about Mac practice, is that we were an ONC, ATCB certified application, making it possible for doctors who prefer to use a Mac, at the time a Mac, I don't think that the iPad had come out yet. Uh, or maybe it had just come out. I think it had just come out, that's right. So making it possible for, uh, for the doctors that prefer to use Apple technology to be able to use that and be able to receive the incentive payments uh, and also be more functional and provide better care. So what's new this year between those two years ago is basically our new iPad applications that we introduced in the middle of December. And the way that those work together in an environment of Mac OS X on the desktop in a doctor's office, as well as working with iOS uh, on tablets, on iPads, and also on iPhones. And we introduced three applications. Um, can I can I point here? Point Please. these applications. Please go for it. So let me describe what everybody, all of your viewers and yourself, are familiar with. You'll all resonate with this. So if you've ever been to an orthodontist, for example, you ever have your kids take them to orthodontist? So you remember when they come in and they sign in? Did they sign into the orthodontist? I, I I don't have kids, so oh, you don't have kids. I don't have I don't have kids, but I, I I know I know what happens whenever I go to any doctor. So maybe maybe I've, we're on the same path. Well, could be other spe- specialties that see a lot of patients at a time. It's very common that they will have a list at the front desk on a clipboard where you sign in and say what time you came in. That's actually not HIPAA compliant because if you can see other patients that are in that office, it says that for example, Tom Cruise is going to a urologist. So that, that's two pieces of information that makes it protected health information. It's the name of the person and also that they're having something that a urologist would do. So that's not HIPAA compliant. What we've done is we've replaced that technology, which is paper, with patient check-in on an iPad. A patient check-in allows the patient to be able to sign in and be able to indicate, confirm that this, this is them. And this information then goes into my practice, into the s- schedule which is on every computer in the office. So that would also be in the examination room where the nurse is, or where the doctor is, where the front desk is, where the billing people are. Everybody knows that this patient has arrived and is in the reception area waiting to be seen in the practice. And it's done HIPAA compliant because there's no, you can't see any other information here. This all happens seamlessly interacting in a HIPAA compliant, HIPAA secure fashion with Mac Practice on the desktop. Mac Practice MD, Mac Practice DDS, DC, or 2020. The next thing that a doctor does when you go into the office or the front desk does is they hand you a clipboard. And on the clipboard you have all these forms that you have to fill out. 
And your first question when you start filling out the forms is, don't they already have my name? Don't they already have my phone number? Don't they already know what insurance I have? Didn't they ask me that question before, before, uh, before I actually came here? Otherwise, I wouldn't have an appointment, correct? So what my practice clipboard does is it takes the information that they've already entered in their system and places it on those forms on clipboard, along with all the other forms that you need to fill out before you're seen. So the first kinds of forms are patient registration forms, your address, your phone number, your date of birth. And you've got that information, and all of that information then automatically goes into my practice without the front desk staff having to do that. So in a way, you're actually entering your own information. There's no redundancy. In a subsequent visit, if you go for a follow-up visit with the same clinic, you're able to look at what you put in in a prior time, and if something's changed, like your phone number or your address, then you could actually make that change. And you're actually making that change. So this is patient-generated data instead of the staff having to enter this information. So it minimizes errors, it eliminates redundancy, it makes, uh, staff loves it obviously because they don't have to enter this information manually. So we're just getting started with information. The other forms that a doctor gives you are your clinical history forms. So it's your social history, your prescription history, um, your surgical history, all the information of where you've been treated, what you've been treated for, uh, what kinds of, have you had an aneurysm, have you had a heart attack, have you had, do you have high blood pressure, all of those, all of that clinical information. Now, when you fill that out on a piece of paper, what do you think happens to that? You mean the paper? It, yeah. Well, it has to be disposed of properly, well, but it has to be transcribed too. Right, it either has to be transcribed or what happens in most offices, they take that paper and they put it in a chart, in a folder along with your other information. Now when you go see the doctor, the doctor has to look at all of this paper in order to be able to diagnose, to know with confidence what your history is and what your situation is medically before they prescribe something for you or before they diagnose the condition that you currently have. So what my practice does is allows you to fill all that paper on a clipboard and that information, not only does it go into my practice MD, but if you choose, if the doctor chooses to use my practice IEHR, it goes in as discrete data into my practice IEHR. Once again, it's information that you enter about yourself going right into your medical record and it's all discrete data. So when the nurse says, well, you know, sometimes you ever fill out those forms and you're not sure you're filling them out correctly? I, I do, I know whenever I do it. So the nurse now can look at it with you and review it before you see the doctor, and that typically happens in many practices. And they can say, well, is this the correct information or not, and confirm it with you, and then they can change it before the doctor actually sees you. But it's all electronic, it's all in your record. Then when the doctor comes in, the doctor can review this information and can then add the information for this particular visit, Do a per, write a prescription right on the iPad, uh, that's also integrated with my practice on the desktop securely. Uh, it's HIPAA compliant. All the, all the, uh, everything is encrypted across the network, and that it is, it is stored in an encrypted manner on the desktop. So all of this information is available. Once again, it's my practice on the desktop. The data that's on the desktop is communicating with the data that's in IEHR in the patient record, and they're leveraging your information that you've entered and adding more for, to it, and then making it available to the doctor to use, and then eventually for you to actually use in a patient portal. Mark, it's almost too bad that Mac Practice has to do this. I mean, this should be the most natural thing in the world, and, and it, it's, it's 2013 and we're talking about this as innovation, which is great, and I wish every doctor I saw would do this, but why is it so hard? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you if you remember, if you've been around Max long enough to remember when QuickTime was introduced. Oh, sure. Do you remember how we used to talk about, you used the term multimedia, but none of us knew exactly what that meant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Okay, so we spent a long time trying to figure out, okay, we got this thing, it's this little window with moving video in it, we've got this term multimedia, but how do we actually use it? Who actually uses it for what purpose? My partner, Patrick Klein, was the first, one of the first people to use it in a business fashion within a matter of months of QuickTime being used. He used it in a dental practice to actually store an intraoral image as a camera went around the patient's mouth so that that could be played back and then frozen and then show a patient what's actually happening in their mouth. So the same when Apple introduced iOS and they introduced the iPhone, we had the first medical application that was practical 
in terms of using it in a doctor's practice. It's taken us some time to be able to do native apps, although we have web, we have web apps immediately using Apple's web developer tools. But these native apps, it's taken us a while to do that, but what we've done is come up with an ecosystem that brings all of these tools that Apple has created on both iOS and Mac OS and allow them to be able to communicate to provide a full solution. And it's when you have this full solution that you begin to understand, that's why I'm excited as a doctor about having an iPad. I mean, it's not, it's great to have an iPad, they're nice and we're, you know, and if it's, if it's, I mean, women love iPads and guys love iPads, guys particularly because guys like any gadgets, right? But the real thing is, how do I use it? I mean, how do I explain that I bought five of them and I have them in my office? I have to have some practical use. And, and, I, and I, I, it's interesting, you answered the question in one direction, and, and I agree with everything you said. I guess what I was thinking about is why does it seem like the medical profession has resisted automation so much? Is it, is it a matter of just, forgive me, but a, a, the, the right generation's dying out and the younger generation's pushing in that are comfortable with this technology as opposed to a paper chart? I, it's a very complicated answer, so I'll try to give you a brief version of what I would suggest are the most important, but there are many factors that make medicine as antiquated as it is. Um, but one of the reasons is, uh, has to do with the fact that people, human beings are resistant to change. Things have been done the same way that they've been done for many, many years. And so it continuously is duplicated. Another is that innovation has been led in hospitals, but there's been little innovation in hospitals. Hospitals are incredibly inefficient. They typically, they have trouble being profitable historically, but there's a drive in hospitals, there's a drive in healthcare to be, to be profitable, to be, uh, even, regardless of profitability, to be efficient, to, you know, to work with less, but provide more and better care. So I think that um, there's also, there's an educational lack. So none of the doctors that went to school had, ex had an, a class and how do I use technology in my practice? Actually, none of them probably had a class and how do I run a business? Because a doctor's office is a business. But here is somebody actually running a business, walking out, because they're a doctor, somehow they're supposed to you know, figure out how to run, how to be an independent business person. There's 160,000 medical practices and probably very few, if any of them, were actually trained in how to run a business. So usually it's a front desk person who certainly has little or no training in running a business who's running their business. I, I hear stories from doctors and medical professionals about that it's almost two sides of the house. There's the medicine side and then there's the business side, often run by an office manager who doesn't always necessarily have experience with healthcare. They're a manager, that's what they do. And the doctor is a health professional and that's what he does. And the integration of the two sometimes is very good and sometimes is not. Well, in my experience, I, I've, I've been doing this for over, over 25 years, and I've had experience with thousands of practices. And in my experience, the best practitioners and the best offices to work in are those when everybody's on the same page. Everybody understands that their focus is to provide the best care, to be the most considerate of each other in the office, to work together as a team. And you're absolutely correct that there's, you know, at the front desk, typically in, a, in the standard office, there's a front desk and that's a billing area, and then you go to the back and that's the clinical area. And there sometimes is even some resentment between the two, thinking that they don't understand each other. But one of the interesting things about introducing electronic clinical records into a medical practice or any kind of a doctor's practice is that everybody has to get on the same page because they're all on the same network. They're all dealing with the same data. Each one of them is adding some piece of data. So in this case, actually, so if I take the scenario that I just showed you, I've got the front desk person entered your information before you came in, correct? Then you came in, you checked in, and you told everybody, I'm here. Everybody. The front desk, if they need billing information, they know you're here. The, if they're preparing something for you in the examination room, the nurse or the doctor, they know that you're here. Then you complete the additional information here. That's clinical information that goes in. But we wouldn't be able to find that information in their system if it didn't have the information that was entered by the front desk person. So all the information is leveraged together. Then that goes back and the electronic health record is here. When you're in the electronic health record, the doctor is now going to say, this is what I did for Chuck. This is the code for that. This is the diagnosis for Chuck. 
this is what the person in the billing department needs to know in order to be able to bill. And so that information is passed from the clinical into the billing. And the people at the front desk, the doctor is going to say, I'd like to see Chuck in 30 days. And the people at the front desk are going to know because of the interaction of a team, I've got to make an appointment with Chuck when he comes out and look at his schedule and make an appointment for 30 days from now. So he knows what the follow-up is. So basically it creates a team so that they can provide all this care for, for the patient working together as a team to do that. And, and I believe as, as the network of, of computers, in our case the networks of, of Mac computers, and as our staff goes in and trains all that staff to work together as a team, understanding what their relationship is, it's almost like Mac practice becomes the core that helps them understand what they actually do. It's a, it's a great point, and I wouldn't have really thought about it until I'm listening to you talk. The, the, the business people are running the billing systems. The back off, or the, the medical practice side, usually for a long time, has had paper files, so the two never interacted. Now they're having to, and back practice is a perfect way to do it. I would say they're getting to. Okay, well, all right. I, I would only, I would only I, honestly, I would only say that because you're right, there's been this dichotomy. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to have somebody who decides that they're going to go out on their own that's worked in a hospital that has no clue what actually happens outside of the clinical area. They work in two completely different systems. But now with this integration, they really can work together as a team, be more productive. And, and the, the people in the billing, you know, I mean, when you stand at the front desk and you make your appointment and you talk to the, you give them their insurance card, and that's the, that is the picture that you have, the first picture that you have as a practice, of the practice, and it's the last picture that every patient has of the practice, no matter what's happened in the room. So from a clinical point of view, the impression that the practice is given is, you know, at the beginning and at the end is, are those people at the front desk? So when you go back to the clinician, if you've got a consistent experience, you've got a great, you, you know, a great experience. I almost said user experience. <laughs> you have a great patient experience. And, and, you, and you want to refer people and you feel comfortable dealing with whatever it is that you're there for that you obviously don't want to be there for. <laughs> Mark, you also kind of slipped something by there too. With Mac practice, it's not just a case of, of, of a medical office buying the software and then having to figure it out. You provide a lot of training as well. And that's, with something this sophisticated, that's a, an essential piece. Well, no office really can get up and running without a minimum, uh, on average, of about three days of training, three full days of training, usually done over a period of a couple of weeks, ideally. Um, and so it takes a lot of behavior modification. It's not just training how do you use a software. It's how you're going to use the software in your practice. There's 100, in medicine, there's 110 different specialties. So they all use software differently. They all run their practices differently. And each doctor has its own personality in terms of the way. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of how they use, how they might run their practice. And so it's really important for, to have trainers that can come on site, that can talk to staff and understand how the staff will work together and how it is that they're going to uh, collaborate to be able to do what they've been doing otherwise in paper or in another computer system that we're replacing to be able to implement that. that. That's a pretty honest admission, and I compliment you for it, to say that my software requires three days of training. So many people would prefer to say, oh yeah, it's so easy, you'll understand it right away. And, and for you to say that and then provide the backup to it is really important, I think. Well, you're segueing into something else I was gonna say. Is that, that is a typical, I, I see a lot of that. And the temptation is for me to say the same thing, because unfortunately, it's, it's too good to be true. Sounds too good to be true because it is too good to be true. It takes it takes time and you know and effort to be able to actually get somebody to use the software. I can sell somebody software. They can buy the software. I can take the money, but I don't really want I, I don't want them to have my software unless they're going to use it unless they're going to use it well. So I, as a part of my business plan, it requires me to be able to provide those services that are necessary to do that. One of the things that we're announcing here at MacWorld is an interface with a product called RT Medibus, which is a cloud-based solution. So now we have, we have IEHR, which works on an iPad. And of course, with an iPad, if they're connected to the internet, they can be remote. They don't have to be in the office. They could be anywhere. Uh, we have MacPractice EMR, and of course, they could be remote connecting to a desktop application that's not uncommon. But a lot of, there are a lot of people that have expressed an interest in having a cloud-based solution. So what we've 
What we've done is we've created a relationship with a company called RT Medibus that has what we think is an excellent solution, and we're supplying the support for the two products interacting together and working together, and we've created a seamless interface. So, however, the competitors in that market, because they typically do not have trainers, so if I don't have trainers as a company, it sounds great for me to say, buy my software, you don't need training, right? And that's what happens in, in a lot of cases, and not just this software, not just medical practice software, but a lot of things. And the reality is, as software of any stripe gets more sophisticated, you need some training. Absolutely, absolutely. If your entire business is gonna run on a software that does your word processing, that does your billing, that sends electronic insurance claims, that collects your images, that does reminders, that does your scheduling, um, that do, collects all your clinical information, uh, and it's going to require customization so it's going to work for your specialty, uh, you have to have somebody help you learn all those things and, and somebody to support that as well, which we do. Mark, where do we send people to learn more about Mac practice? Because obviously there's a lot here to learn and, and uh, talk about. Well, I would love for uh, all of your viewers to look, go to MacPractice.com. On MacPractice.com, when they go to the homepage, they'll be able to pick whichever product is appropriate to them, whether it's MacPractice MD, MacPractice DDS, MacPractice DC, or MacPractice 2020. And once they click on the appropriate icon, they'll have a website that's just specifically geared to them that will answer many, many of their questions. And they will also be able to register to see QuickTime videos of the application. Once they've seen the videos and had a chance to, to get some familiarity, there definitely are going to be questions they're going to have. They're going to want to know, how much is it going to cost for my practice? They're going to want to know, do I, which abilities am I, should I be interested in? What do these abilities do? And so then they would talk to a Mac practice practice consultant in their area who is likely to either be the person or one of the, one of the people in their organization is going to be able to actually do their on-site training should they purchase Mac practice. And they'll guide them through the process of evaluating Mac practice for their for their business. Mark is MacPractice.com. MacPractice.com. Mark, I always enjoy our conversations because I learn so much and there's so much to learn. So we have to do it more often. Uh, I'd love to do it. Anytime, Chuck. I'm yours. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, next time you go to the doctor, tell them about Mac practice. It'll make their life easier and certainly will make your life easier. Until the next time, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices at Macworld iWorld 2013. Thanks for watching. Mac Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices Group at macvoicesgroup.com. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.